Guy Ford is back here. Thanks a lot. And thanks Sorry. for being so generous as a comedian. I think yeah, I, we all really appreciate it. Um, two quick questions. This kind of intricately in exploring your moral core in all these like horrible lapses in morality and everything, does that go all the way back to you starting as a comedian? You know, because you said you started in high school, so I was wondering if that was true. And then also, how did you get into directing and how did you learn about directing? And direct, you know, along the line. Well, uh, when I was, I started stand up in high school and I didn't care about my moral core or whatever. I don't think I have one of those, but uh, <laughs> I didn't think about that. I just wanted to try to be funny. Uh, several years of, that's why it really takes like 20, 20 years to make a good comedian, because at least for the first 10 or 12, for the first 10 years, you're just trying to learn to be funny, so you just come up with, hey, maybe a joke about rocks would be good, and you <laughs> apply your comedy knowledge to rocks, and, and then you try current events for a while, and they, those come and go, and then you're also sort of joining a chorus of hate when you do that. And uh, so you try all this stuff, and none of it, some of it works, and then you start hating it. So after 10 years of learning how to be funny and how to just do the work of being a comedian, like just like learning piano. It's like if you were learning piano on really shitty pieces, but you are getting the skill. And then you go through five years or so of reject, realizing that you've wasted 10 years <laughs> talking about nothing <laughs> to drunks in bars, and it's too late to go back and do anything else with your life. It's a bad time. So then you have five years of just like repeating the shit you've been doing and not knowing why, and then either you bottom out or you go write for a better comedian or you give up or kill yourself <laughs> or something else comes in and gives you, you got something else that you want to talk about. So other shit came to me that I wanted to talk about. So I changed in that way. I learned how to direct, uh, uh, I lo worked for local access cable TV station in Newton, Massachusetts where I grew up and I learned how to run video cameras and how to edit. Uh, I shot. Uh, hockey games for my high school and stuff like that. And then I'd do like little art pieces and then I'd, I'd take the cameras home and make my own little funny videos. That's kind of where I started. And then every time I had any little bit of money from doing stand-up, I would make short films. I made short films th throughout <coughs> my years. You know, I, they, the short films for me go back to, I don't know, 89 or something like that. And I'd go to festivals with them. It's just something I've always loved. I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to college. Um, on the aisle here in the red. Hi, um, thank you very much for this. This is really, really um, valuable. I just want to know what you have to say about censorship in terms of being a stand-up. Uh, you probably had to clean up your act when you did like Conan or Letterman and stuff and you're someone whose act is not clean. How do you deal with being told all the time you must be clean, you must be clean, but knowing in your bones that you're not someone who is you know, like, if you're someone who, yeah. if you're someone who swears a lot and yeah. you know that's your essence or whatever, what's your advice? Well, it, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it's all about the venue, like where you're working is what decides what you get to say. I never felt, uh, I mean, I, I don't get why we can't all say anything we want on TV. I don't, nobody's ever explained to me why that isn't illegal. <laughs> I don't get why there's an FCC that can make those rules. I don't understand it. It doesn't jibe with what I understand about America and the First Amendment. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, they're just words, right? What? They're just words. Yeah. But, <laughs> want to let me finish? <laughs> uh, but when you're working for a network, the FCC rules aren't usually the, the challenge. It's every network has a standards and practices person. And, uh, Networks that go over the air are the ones that you have to have an FCC thing, but cable, uh, you can say whatever you want, but it's the, as far as the law, but every network has their set of rules because they, it's not just, you know, none of us have a right to be on TV. It's not, it's their channel. I mean, they set the fucking thing up. They bought a big dish and they have a satellite, they have a satellite. They launch satellites into space. So for them not to have the right to, decide what's on it, I think it's stupid. I think they, I, it's really boring to me when anybody in TV goes like, well, assholes won't let me do it. Well, it's their fucking, why can't they enjoy what they put on too? And the way they pay for all that shit is advertising. And so they have sort of a, they, every place hires somebody who's there to kind of, who just knows 
where they're going to get in trouble and lose money. That's all. It's money. I mean, everything has to be paid for. Uh, anyway, when you do Conan shows like that, it's really it's harder because it's the FCC. It's the airwaves. And uh, it's a game, though. It's kind of fun. I had, I had show, jokes improved by censorship. When I was at uh, Conan, I did stand-up on the show. And I knew the standards guy because I was a writer. So I could actually, he t I did a joke about Giuliani at the time, who was the mayor of New York. And he was angry because somebody threw shit on a, piece, on a picture of Jesus or so. I don't know what it was. It was something where somebody made a piece of art that was they smeared elephant shit on a picture of Jesus' mother. Uh, don't get mad at me. It's somebody did that. <laughs> somebody did that. And Giuliani shut the funding down. And so, and he said, people pick on Catholics. That's the problem is that everybody feels like they can pick on Catholics. And I had this joke where I said, yeah, it's true people pick on Catholics, but that's just because they're wrong about God. <laughs> and uh, it's just a brazen asshole joke. So I, I wanted to do it on Conan and the Sanders guy said, no way. So I called him, I said, I think I should, I learned how to argue with Sanders people. I said, I think I have a right to say this because he's on, the news saying his half, so it's an equal time issue. And he goes, all right, but find out how can you say it that's not so offensive? I don't want to get phone calls. So we talked about it. He had this idea. He said, um, what if you sound, first of all, really sympathetic when you say, it's true, people do pick on Catholics a lot. But that's because they're wrong about God. Like he said, if you make it like a sillier turn, you show some sympathy, and then it's going to be clear you're joking when you say that. And I did it, and I got a way bigger laugh. Like, it was an improvement. <laughs> so, I don't know. That was a fun exercise to me. It's, a, it's an intellectual exercise, the, the censorship sometimes. Uh, FX is very different. They don't, it, I, I don't understand how they're letting me do this shit. I don't. <laughs> I don't understand it. When I handed in the God episode, that's the one I was the most worried about because it was barely funny and it was insane. And, it's, and I'd say this shit about Jesus. I mean, it's crazy. It, usually Jesus and the church is the one place you can't touch on television. It's the one place where no standards person will let you fuck around. And I was worried about that episode and I handed it in. Um, it was one of the last ones and nobody called me. Usually they call me right after they watch it. Nobody called. <laughs> and I got really scared. Because every single episode up until then, they'd call me right, and I knew they'd watched it. I knew literally they watched it on a server that I control, and I know when it's been watched. I know, it's, I'm crazy. <laughs> so, so I knew they watched it, and nobody called me, and then I'm waiting, and then the next day I write my, the one uh, guy I have there, executive, who's very sympathetic, and I wrote him, I said, hey, did you like it? No answer. And then I called him, and he didn't call me back. And it, it, I was getting really upset. And then I got a call, I got an email from him saying, you must call me this instant. And I was like, this is, it's over. Because of Jesus. <laughs> so I call him and he said, uh, in 20 minutes, uh, we're going to announce that your show's picked up for a second season. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, I wasn't even thinking about that or expecting it, or I really thought we were probably going to get canceled and... I was like, what? And he said, yeah, just don't tell anybody. You have 20 minutes, you have to keep it a secret. And he hung up on me. <laughs> and then I called him back and I said, wait a minute, what about the God episode? And he goes, oh, it's great. It, don't touch it. It's great. <laughs> it's great. No notes. We love it. So, and I did. We, Standards and I had some issues with the God episode. But I think she helped it, too. She's a, there's a woman there, and she's brilliant. She's very smart. And her goal is to keep the show as irreverent as possible by keeping it away from any place where it's going to get it. Because if I piss off somebody enough, they're going to, you know, it takes one person to go, eh, eh, and then the party's <laughs> over. So. Oh, uh, it's up to him. What am I doing? <laughs> uh, it's uh, on the aisle in back. Uh, yeah, probably you're right next to you. Um, when did you know you were a good comic? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> he's still got the mic like he's ready with more. Um, no, I, I don't know. I, uh, when I first did it, I bombed really bad. I was so out of sorts. It was the worst thing I'd ever, that had ever happened to me the very first time I did it. 
And I did it a second time just because I wanted to know if it was really that bad, if it was just a bad night. And it was worse. <laughs> and so that was when I was in high school. And then I didn't do it again for almost a year. And then I went to this weird offbeat place in Cambridge, Massachusetts that was just fun, weird. It was an uh, off-the-wall cinema. It was a place where you would watch like uh, Dada films and eat carrot cake. <laughs> and uh, they did stand-up comedy midnight on Saturdays. So I went to the show and it was really weird show, strange, trippy comedians. And I tried it there and I had a really great set. That was my third time on stage, and I thought, I can do this. And then I bombed several times after that, but I didn't care, because that one set really got the hook in me. So that's, I, I didn't know if I was good at it, I just thought, I have, a, I have a way that this is something I could do that I enjoy. People laughed, you know, those 14 people in that club were responsible for a lot, because <laughs> if I'd bombed that third time, I probably, I probably wouldn't be alive <laughs> at all. I don't think I had a shot at anything else, really. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, white shirt in the center there. Uh, a couple rows back. I was wondering if you would comment about your time with the Dana Carvey show. Uh, talk about any creative process or anecdotes that you have from that. <laughs> and secondly, uh, the way that that show was handled, did that impact what you fight for with creative control or what sort of impact that had? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, that show was a really difficult time for me. It was bad. I mean, I hated it. And it's a good show, but I had a hard time. Dana was uh, you know, hot coming out of SNL, and ABC gave him a show um, and said, we want you to be edgy and irreverent and be really out there. And then uh, while we were starting to produce the show, uh, ABC was bought by Disney, like literally in the middle of our pre-production. And then they just a whole different people, group of people came and said, uh, yeah, you, they put Dane on the cover of Time, TV Guide with uh, or Kermit the Frog with his arm around Kermit the Frog. <laughs> and he never posed for that picture. Dana was furious to see himself <laughs> hold, you know, with his arm around Kermit the Frog. <laughs> you know. <laughs> like him and Kermit were at the China Club and then somebody came over and he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that was it. The show had such a, uh, you know, it was very, everything we did made somebody mad. But I learned, did learn from that. What, one thing I learned was that there wasn't any need for us to be on, we were on primetime television. The show was like at 9 o'clock at night on ABC. It was just a mistake. Those people didn't want to see us. And I read letters, like handwritten letters by people. There was no email then. You got handwritten letters from old ladies saying, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I, I learned from that kind of like, you got to go where you're wanted, you know? So I'm on FX and it's, you know, they had, I remember when I was trying to find what the line was on FX, there was, I was watching The Shield and there is a scene where a woman has been raped and murdered and somebody says, oh, and he ejaculated on her stomach. And then they snap zoom in to a pool of jizz on a dead lady, <laughs> on a dead lady's stomach. And a friend of mine, Vernon Chapman, who's a great comedy guy, he said, you should, because we're not allowed to show boobs on the show, he said, you should have a, a shot of a woman who's naked and cover her boobs with the jizz on the stomach of a dead lady. <laughs> like, this is okay. <laughs> Beautiful life-giving breasts are not okay. The mother's milk, gorgeous. Michelangelo made us cry when he painted them, not okay jizz on the stomach of a dead woman. <laughs> totally. Why, why are you even asking? So, so when I, me, that's, so that, that's I, I should be on a network that lets you do that. I should be, I should not, this show should never be on anywhere else. If I got some weird call from NBC saying we want it, I'd say no. You're fucking wrong. The people who watch your network don't want this. It's not fair to them. So I kind of learned that from Dana Carvey. That was a hard show to work on, though. It was just a lot of hours. I was there all night, every night. I, was, I cried like a lot on that show. <laughs> like I wept like a baby from exhaustion and, and just pressure. It was hard. And I was in tw my 20s. I was like 25 years old. 
So it was a lot, and I was the head writer. It was a lot of, a lot of pressure. I'm glad I did it. It's a huge education. Um, it's a young lady uh, on the aisle here. There you go. Are the scenes with the uh, other comics improvised, or is it totally scripted, like with Nick DiPaolo? The, the, the poker scene was scripted uh, as far as once we start really talking about uh, gay sex and asking those questions. And also the thing of all the stuff, most of the stuff of me talking about packing dicks into his mother's ass <laughs> was it's about a half scripted, a half. But once we shot the scene once, it was a really long day because we shot the scene once, like scripted, and then I gave everybody a shot at screwing around and improvising, and then we all started getting a little punchy, and everybody started saying funny shit about wearing flip flops and stuff, and then we kept shooting to get that, and then everyone was so warmed up that I was like, guys, can I just have the scene as written all over again on everybody's close up? And they were like, fuck, and I made them do that. Everybody's happy because the scene came out good, but it was a lot. It was both, we kept shifting from scripted to, um, to some improvised. I, I don't usually do much improving in uh, this show because we shoot it like cinema. We shoot it you know, with a lot of coverage and we pick lenses carefully. So it's a kind of, if you improvise once, you kind of have to. But this scene ended up cutting together nicely because uh, we didn't follow the script. And I, the camera kept kind of going around in this spiral circle. This kind of the way we shot it in this weird spiral. And I liked that we would catch sometimes in the middle of a move and some, some of the dialogue is clipped. Um, I liked that. So that's how we did that one. Um, stripes in front here. Um, in your mind, do you have a filter between topically, like what is good for stand-up and what is good for the show? Are there things in the show, topics or scenes, that you would want to do stand-up but just don't work? Or how do you differentiate for yourself? Well, it's one other thing I love about doing this show is that it all comes from the same place. Like, uh, I kind of think of every episode as a stand-up set. And some things are said with my face and some are said with a lot of people's faces. And uh, the subjects cling together in the, about as much as they do on stage, that I'll talk about something and sometimes I'll, I'll talk about something else tangentially or I'll just suddenly just change the subject because I feel like it. So the show does that sometimes. Sometimes it's following a line and sometimes it just goes, ah, anyway, you get it, here's this now. Uh, so uh, every, but it's, it's a great, for me it's great because every time I have an idea of an area to talk, to do on the show, I can just make that choice. I, if it's not coming together as stand-up material, oh, well, maybe I should be showing this. So it's kind of 50-50. I mean, it's whatever. It depends on the subject. The gay thing, the, the poker thing, that was a real conversation I had with that comedian uh, years ago. And I thought, I should tell that story on stage. But then I thought, I'm not going to stand there and tell that story. It was his story. And I actually got him to, you know, that, that's the real guy. He's just a comedian from here in New York. So that was one, one thing where I thought about it on stage first and then thought I'd shoot it. All right, we got time for one more, uh, I think. I hate this godlike power. Sorry, everybody. Um, right, right, right in the yeah, center. They, with nobody the, over there. Okay, nobody over there asked anything. I mean, they want to. Uh, all right, uh, right next to you there. Hi. Oh, my voice is horrible on this. Uh, I'm a film production soon. And um, what is the, I actually wrote a script and based it off you and your show. And because uh, I like your tone. And, uh, what is the best advice you can give for like a student and like attitude when you're doing that? Because you kind of say a big F you to a lot of people, and I like that. Say you mean at, was I like you, attitude when you're um, what attitude when, you when you're have? yeah when you're in the production, which you've done it all, it's, and what what's the best attitude to really get? The best attitude in production is really uh, uh, really wanting to help a lot, uh, really wanting to help whoever's show it is. Uh, be really great. I mean, just, I mean, I think that's anybody who's doing any job, yeah. really, should want that job to be done really well. I mean, this is a simple answer, but it's really true. Yeah. Uh, there's one person, really, usually, that has an idea of how to do something, and everybody else should really want, I mean, it's such a rare and great gift to get a job in show business. It's very, very, it's not, you're not going to get one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Statistically, you're, you're, you're not. So, 
you know, it's like when, when unemployment is like a 2%, they say it's full employment. Like, it's, that's how low your odds are that statistically you're not going to get a, a job that you really want in show business. So if you do, holy shit. What if I was and and the way I would approach it is I want to do everything I can to make myself valuable to these people. That's, that's when you do it, when you're in production and you just see somebody kicking ass and wanting what they do to go well, um, you just never forget them. I mean, I have people I've kept around uh, for years and years and I just beg, there's people that don't want to do this shit anymore and I beg them to stay on for me. That my DP, uh, Paul Kessner, is a genius, but he wants to be on a boat all the time. He has a fucking boat, and he takes it to the Bahamas and shit. And so every time when we got season two, he's, it, he's the only one who didn't want to hear it. I'm like, we got picked up, and he's like, ah. Uh. And I'm like, please get off the fucking boat. Because he's so eager to make what I see in my head real. That's, and so, that's the way, all the way up to the very closest person. And then actually when you're the person who's running the thing, which is definitely not gonna happen to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to impress upon you how, if you get there, how rare that ex chance is gonna be and how important it is to seize it. If you get to be the person who gets to run the thing, then you have to kind of turn the same attitude on them that you have to enable all those people to do their jobs and. And I'm, I'm just the directorial department. I'm also the writing department and the editorial department um, and the uh, lead actor. But, uh, but I just run those parts of the show. Everybody else has to, I have to know what they do. I know what everybody does because I was an intern. I mean, I, 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 I carried camera cases. I did everything. And I hung lights in the studio. So I know everything that goes on. So I know what I'm asking people to do. I know what I'm asking them to take on. I think it's arrogant to think that you can just force your will on a crew of people. It's, you've got to be a human being if you're a director or if you're a sound person. When I was shooting Pootie Tang, there was a young <laughs> chick who was the, boom, we had a boom operator, it was this young student who came on for one day and we're all ready to shoot this really intricate s shot and she didn't like how she had the boom, so she just went, wait a minute, I'm not ready. <laughs> and everyone was like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> Because she was being belligerent and shitty. And so the person who we replaced her with was a real human being. They, just, they treated, us, treated us like human beings. Everybody just wants to be treated de decently. It's, it's, life's too short to be an asshole as an employer or an employee. So if everybody, yeah. If everybody likes the work and everybody wants the show to be as good as possible and everybody treats each other with respect, the show's gonna be, and I, we have so much fun on this show because we don't have anybody on the set who everyone goes, oh, Jesus. I mean, it, it may be me. <laughs> and then there's only one then, so, you know. I, the only question I wanna answer, because everybody asks it, is about the middle finger during the opening credits. Uh, I know somebody here wants to ask it, so I'm gonna answer it. During the opening credits of the show, some guy flips off the camera. It was a young uh, NYU looking kid. Um, <laughs> spiky hair and just real contrary. And he was walking with some real, yeah, fuck everything type. I mean, I really, I was eating the pizza and I saw them and I, was, I already thought, Jesus. And they walked by and they were like, because they saw a camera and they saw people making a sincere effort at something. It was <laughs> like, just offensive to them. So one of them went, yeah, and he flipped off the camera. And I remember that moment very well because I was eating the pizza and I watched him flip off the camera and I could tell by the angle that we caught it. And I thought, that's, it. when that happened, I knew we were gonna be on TV. <laughs> because that was when we were shooting the pilot and it was a test to see if we could get it. But for, for some reason, I remember seeing that and thinking, that's just meant to be, that that's gonna be in the opening credits. It'll be fuzzy, because I fucking know how the camera works. It's gonna be a little fuzzy, because it's out of the depth of field, um, and, and people are gonna see it. I just knew, that was just a sign to me, <laughs> that we would get to be on TV. So there is a God. There is a God, he gave me the finger. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, Louis C.K., thank you thank very you. much. <laughs>